This is the Become the Lion podcast. If you are aiming to become the top in your industry, not second, not above average, the top, then you have come to the right place. Become the Lion will provide you with weekly insights and motivation needed from our guests on how to escape the common herd that society lives in. If you're looking to change your life, then get ready. Welcome to Become the Lion. This is Trevor Nicholas from Become the Lion, and today on the show, we have Stacy Ferreira. Stacy is an American entrepreneur, speaker, and co-author of the book, Two Billion Under 20. Stacy is the CEO and founder of Forge. She was also a Teal Fellow and on Forbes 30 Under 30. Stacy, welcome to Become the Lion. Thanks so much. I'm excited to be here. And Stacy, what always intrigues me about different entrepreneurs is their start. And do you mind explaining how you got started in entrepreneurship for our audience? Yeah, definitely. So um, I guess I'll, I'll start way back at the beginning. Uh, I grew up in Arizona, and I have a brother who's two years older than me. And in middle school and high school, my brother and I became really fascinated with video games. <laughs> Um, and we, we played a ton of video games together and eventually one day we said, Hey, wouldn't it be cool if we could go and create our own online video game for people to play? And that really spurred my interest in technology and his interest in technology. And over the next couple of years, we played around and built a few websites for friends and family and just for ourselves. And then eventually once I graduated from high school, my brother and I went to our parents and we said, Hey, uh, rather than getting internships for the summer, we'd love to go and start our own business. And at the time, my parents, being very traditional, said, you know, if, if you want to go and start a business rather than get an internship, you need to move out of the house and learn how to be financially independent. And so my brother and I packed up our bags with just an idea for a company, and we moved to South Central Los Angeles. And in South Central LA, we found cheap rent and teamed up with a friend, Shiv Prakash, and the three of us worked that summer on building uh, basically what was an idea and turned into a, a business, which was a username and password storage site that allowed people to store all their usernames and passwords and then log into all their sites online with just one username and password. And that kind of was the kickstart to the entrepreneurial journey. So you're living in Arizona and you move out to central Los Angeles. I have to ask you, what was that experience like? Yeah, so as I say, at the time it was a little bit nerve wracking, right? I, I was an 18 year old who um, had never really, I, I mean, I traveled with my family growing up, but had never lived on my own. You know, it was the first time that I was on my own, paying my own rent and bills and and starting this new thing, and um, as as everyone here probably knows, when you're first starting your very first company, you know you have a lot of questions. What? How, how are you going to grow this thing? How are you going to build this thing? Um, and then all the details associated with with those two things. So everything was completely new, but overall it was a really exciting experience and and kind of the leap that that I felt I needed to take early on in order to. Notice that it's all right to take those big risks, and it's all right to to do that and keep pushing forward. And as your journey on as being an entrepreneur, what were some of the challenges that you've had to overcome? What are some of the challenges? Well, a lot of things. Um, I was gonna say when it was when I was first starting my social cloud with my brother and Shiv, uh, we had a, a massive learning curve. Um, first we had a massive learning curve because none of us had ever built, a, basically a technology solution from the ground up before that was that complex that had that many kind of security challenges. So just technically building something was a little bit of a challenge in the beginning. And then as we continued to grow that company, we went on to raise money. So we raised a $1.2 million seed round fairly early on in that business life cycle. And there were challenges of just knowing what to do in order to raise that money, how to target investors, how to um, have a conversation with investors, how to make a pitch deck. There was kind of that steep learning curve from there. And then as we continue to grow the company, I think there's always a challenge when you're trying to hire people. 
I would say this is the one thing that's persisted in growing my social cloud, eventually selling it. And now with what I'm working on at Forge, um, hiring people tends to be the constant challenge. You're looking for people who are um, in and of themselves a little bit of a unicorn who has kind of the unique magic that you need in order to contribute to a small team in the startup. Um, so I'd say that's probably the biggest one, but lots of little challenges along the way. What was it like pitching your idea to investors? Yeah. So in the beginning, again, one of those things that's sort of nerve wracking when you first do it. Um, I remember looking back at, at the early days of my social cloud, pitching some of our first investors and, and it would be kind of the activity for the day. It would be, you know, oh, I've got this big pitch coming up this day. And then the more that you do it, um, the more you start to realize that it's, it's just one of those things that you have to do as a business owner. If you're running a company that's, that's going to be venture backed, um, just making sure that, that you're keeping your business capitalized. You have enough of the resources to do what you need to do in order to be successful, um, just becomes a part of the everyday life. What do you attribute to your success? I would attribute surrounding myself with people smarter than myself on my team. Um, I, I kind of said earlier that hiring is one of the biggest challenges, finding the right people, but I think that uh, my success has come from surrounding myself with those right people, taking the time to, to make the right hires, taking the time to learn about the other people that are on my team and, and what makes them successful in, in their own life and career. And then helping those people become successful themselves who in turn help make, help make my dreams successful as well. Do you think surrounding yourself with the right people is really going to help someone who wants to become successful? Definitely. I think, I think you learn a lot by being around people that are smarter than you are, that, that can kind of impart some of that wisdom on you. Um, you know, if, if you're a kind of a, a good example of this might be here, here at Forge now, the company that I've started after selling my social cloud, um, one of my biggest rules whenever we hire someone is, you know, always ask this person, what can we learn from them during the interview process? Because I think that surrounding yourself with people who are eager to learn, people who are eager to teach other people, kind of have this mindset of growth. Um, and that's something that you definitely need, especially when you're starting a new company. You need people who are going to get down in the weeds, but then grow with the company as it grows. And that's truly, I think, what makes companies successful. It's it's not an idea. It's It's purely execution. And execution comes from the people that you have on your team and the people that you surround yourself with who can tell you to avoid pitfalls and mistakes that they may have made in a past life. And when you're hiring people for your company, do you have a sense during the interview process whether they're going to be a good fit or not? Yeah, definitely. Um, I was going to say, so the way that we conduct hiring here at Forge is I typically will do a 30-minute phone screening with someone first before anyone else on my team talks to them. And you might think that that's a lot of time for a founder and CEO to spend uh, with someone or to do the first screening is, is somewhat unheard of. Um, but when you, when you look at it and say, you know, your team is such an integral part to making this successful, I think those 30 minutes are very well spent. And typically in the first 10 minutes of those 30, I can tell if the person's going to be a cultural fit or not, just based off of the way that they can talk, conduct themselves in an interview um, their answers to some of the questions that I ask. So I can typically tell kind of the answer to the culture question fairly quickly. And then from there, it becomes a process of weeding out based off of, depending on what, what role you're hiring for, based off of their technical skills or how deep they can get into process if you're looking for someone who can really come into your company and, and put in place process. Um, and that takes a little bit longer. We typically want to spend an hour to a few hours with a candidate um, just learning about what they've done previously. And then depending on, again, the role, if it's a leadership role, I like to kind of get them in another environment. 
So I've talked to them at this point on the phone and then typically for an on-site interview. And then if it's a leadership role, again, I want to take them to grab coffee or take them to grab a lunch and learn how they interact in a little bit of a different setting um, to really understand how is this person going to be um, not only sitting here at the office, but out with their friends talking about our brand and talking about what we're building. I know I mentioned in your bio at the beginning of the show that you were a Teal Fellow, and I wanted to ask you, how has a Teal Fellow, being a Teal Fellow, changed your life? I think being a, a, a part of the Teal Fellowship Network has definitely changed my life. I think there are a lot of young kids in the Teal Fellowship and in, in the Teal Fellowship community at large that are working on some really interesting ideas. And I've also kind of been through a lot of the struggles that either I've been through or am going through in growing my own business. Um, being a, a solo, solo founder is, is really hard. Um, so you want to make sure that if you're doing it alone, and even if you're not, you have a good support network of, of people that you can lean on to ask questions and just kind of gut check against things that you're doing day to day. And for someone listening in our audience who might not know what the Teal Fellowship is, do you mind explaining it to them? Definitely. So the Teal Fellowship is a program that was created about seven years ago now with the thesis that you don't have to complete college in order to be successful. And the fellowship was uh, spearheaded and started by Peter Teal, who was one of the uh, early investors in Facebook and a founder at PayPal. And basically his premise was, again, this idea that you don't have to complete college to be successful. And in order to kind of prove that point, he was going to give 20 kids who were 20 and under 20, um, $100,000 over the course of two years to drop out of college and start a business. Being a young entrepreneur, how do you get people to take yourself seriously? I think the biggest thing even being a young entrepreneur or just <laughs> being older in your career, the biggest thing to be taken six year, to be taken seriously is to just know more about the topic that you're speaking about than anyone else. Um, it's doing your homework, doing your research, truly becoming an expert in a field and, and knowing how to have an intelligent conversation around that topic. And then to kind of take that one step further, Again, I go back to this mindset of learning and growth. I think it's really important. Uh, pe people will take you seriously if you're open to new ideas and if you're open to listening and, and taking in um, kind of feedback in order to frame your own perspective and ideas. You've written the book or co-written the book, Two Billion Under 20. Do you mind explaining that about it uh, to our audience? Definitely. So Two Billion Under 20 is a book that I co-authored with Jared Kleiner. Um, the two of us kind of teamed up after I had sold my first company to Reputation.com with the thesis that there were hundreds of young kids across the globe who had amazing stories of things that they had done a lot with technology um, in their early years. And so kind of the thesis of the book that we wanted to get at was we wanted to give some of these kids a platform and an ability to share their stories and their journeys. So two billion under 20 is, is a compilation of 75 short stories between one to five pages of young kids across the globe, just talking a little bit about their successes, their, their failures, the things that they fear, the things that they're excited for in the future, and kind of just giving this holistic view of what it is to be a millennial um, in the world today. Do you think people almost don't take millennials as serious as they should and they almost like laugh them off? I think that this is something that happens generation after generation. Um, if you look at, you know, our grandparents' generation, I think they looked at our parents' generation and said, you know, here are the things that they're doing wrong or here are the th reasons why this generation isn't, isn't doing something right. And I think the same thing in turn has happened where, you know, a one generation or two generations um, kind of older from the millennial generation have that same attitude. Um, I don't think it's it's something that's necessarily widespread. Um, I think it's something that the media has hyped up a little bit in the sense that uh, there are a lot a, a hundreds of articles online about millennials being entitled, about millennials being stupid, 
Um, and I think a lot of that stuff gets surfaced because it's controversial because there are a lot of people, um, who are in the millennial generation and then people who are, who are publishing these articles and writing these articles. Um, and I think technology is kind of changing the way that, that this information comes to fruition. So I think it's, it's a lot more easily accessible. Um, but on the whole, I think that, uh, that there is a, in general, a positive connotation on the millennial generation and our willingness to collaborate, to use technology to help make everyone win and to use our passion towards um, making making a big difference in the world. Cece, I wanted to ask you, what do you think has to happen in your life in the next three years to make you feel as though you've been successful? I think the older that I get, success, the kind of the idea of success has, has changed over time. Um, you know, before starting the first business, success was just being able to start that business and being able to fundraise and being able to, um, then sell that business. And, um, once, once I kind of did that six, the, the bar of success had kind of raised in some sense. I wanted to to start another business. I wanted to grow it in terms of revenue more than the previous one. I wanted to um, grow it in terms of team more than the previous one. Um, and then success has also kind of taken on a different form again, as I continue to get older, where I used to think about success in terms of career. And now a lot of times I, I think of success in terms of career, but I also think of it in terms of personal relationships and the people that I'm able to give back to the people that I'm able to help, and then just my friends and how am I performing as, as a friend? And am I someone that, that people feel like they can trust and come to? And I would say success for me now means um, developing those friendships and being that person that other people can lean on. So kind of coming back to your question, what has to happen for me to be successful in the next three years? Really, it's being mindful of the relationships that I have. Um, and pushing forward on work, but not always letting work um, get in the way of those relationships. Being a startup founder, what does your average day look like? Oh man, the average day is completely different depending on the day. Um, right now, I would say I probably spend 50% of my time working on product-related things. Um, to frame and give a little bit of context for Forge, we've been working on uh, we've been working on Forge for about a year now. We're building basically you could call it flexible enterprise scheduling software that allows hourly employees, so people who work in retail and restaurant locations, to be able to pick and choose what hours they want to work so that they can work semi on demand. And in order to do this, there's a lot that has to be accomplished from a product perspective. Um, and since we're a small team, we're, we're seven people today, I have kind of taken on the role of founder, CEO, and product manager. So a lot of times I spend days sitting with our engineers, making sure that from a product perspective, we're clear on what the spec is and what needs to be done. We're clear on the two-week sprint that we have and on the deliverables that need to be completed at the end of that two-week sprint. Um, I'm going through and kind of QA and testing product to make sure that we've accounted for everything that needs to be accounted for for our customers. And then I spend probably 40% of the time talking to clients, talking to customers, um, doing customer support, doing sales, making sure that we're continuing to grow, but we're also continuing to be mindful of product market fit as we move from our small business segment into a mid-market client segment. And then I probably spend the other 10% of the time working on hiring and looking for other people who want to be a part of our organization and help bring flexibility to the hourly workforce. And Stacey, I wanted to say this interview has been excellent so far. And now we're going to enter the lines around. I'm going to ask you a couple of quick questions before we end the show today. Sounds great. What would you say to someone who's just starting out and going after their dream? I would say find a mentor, someone who's done some, something somewhat similar to what you'd like to do, become their friend and ask them a million questions. And then as you continue on your journey, use that person as someone who you can look to for guidance and someone who will be there to help support you. 
And at the same time, um, make sure that it's a two way street. So be willing to also teach them something and ask them and, and answer their questions. Um, but find that mentor and someone that you can really have as, as the person that you can call when things get rough. Um, cause when you're going out on your own, they definitely do, but you will get through it if you find that mentor. Do you happen to have two or three books that you'd recommend our audience read? Yeah, so two of my favorite books. Uh, the first one that I'll recommend is a book by Keith Ferrazzi called Never Eat Alone. And the premise of the book is basically that you should be spending every meal with someone. Every meal is an opportunity to learn something new, to meet someone new who can help you on your journey or who you can help on their journey. So Never Eat Alone by Keith Ferrazzi is one. And then the second one that I'll recommend is a book called The Hard Thing About Hard Things by Ben Horowitz. It's a book that kind of shows his journey through startups and, and all the hard lessons that he's learned along the way. For anyone that wants to build kind of a high growth technology company, I would highly, highly, highly recommend reading that book um, and, and just learning and gleaning as much as you can from it. And anyone in our audience who's listening right now and would like any of the books that Stacey mentioned for free, you can go to audibletrial.com slash BTL. And Stacey, last question of the day, where can our audience find you? Yeah, so the audience can find me on Facebook. Um, just type in Stacy Ferreira on Facebook and I should pop up. And same on, on Twitter and on LinkedIn. Just twitter.com backslash Stacy Ferreira. And then same with LinkedIn. LinkedIn.com backslash in backslash Stacy Ferreira. And Stacy, I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time today to speak with our audience. Definitely. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to Become the Lion. Everything from today's show will be in our show notes on our website. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review on iTunes. Till next week, don't stop grinding.